The hardest part about learning Latin for native English speakers has to be the case system. I'm talking about how Latin changes the endings of nouns based on how that noun is used in a sentence. So, a noun will look different when it's the subject or the object of the verb, or when it shows possession. This video will give a basic introduction to the six main cases for the Latin noun. So I said there were six main cases, but there's actually five big ones, then a slightly less important sixth, that's the vocative, and then a seventh, the locative, which I won't discuss here because it's not used for most nouns. So the big five first. Here they are, the nominative, genitive, dative, accusative, and ablative cases in standard American order. If you're struggling with remembering this order, it helps to see that it's actually reverse alphabetical. In Britain, the order is a little bit different, nominative, vocative, accusative, genitive, dative, ablative. And this order reflects the fact that the nominative and vocative are often identical, that the accusative is pretty darn important, and that the dative and ablative are often the same. But here in America, we do it our own way, and so this American order will be how I'll introduce each case. First, it's helpful to see how the different declensions, the different groups of nouns, have different endings for each case. So here's the singular, and you can see how the nominative often ends in an S, and the accusative case in an M. This is the neuter singular, which is found in only declensions 2, 3, and 4. You can see that the nominative and accusative are identical here. And here's the plural. The genitive plural ends in some form of um. The dative and ablative are identical in each declension, and the accusative plural ends in an S. Here's the neuter plural, and again, the nominative and accusative repeat and end in an A for each declension. Okay, so the endings are just endings. The big question is what they actually mean. That's where a good understanding of the cases comes in. First, the nominative case. This is used for the subjects of sentences. If the sentence is active, then it's the thing doing the verb. So, puela dormit, the girl is sleeping. Puela is our nominative subject she is doing the sleeping. In Latin sentences, the nominative must agree in number with the verb. That means if the nominative subject is singular, then the verb must also be singular. Here, since puela is singular, dormit is also singular. If we change it to puelai, plural, then we must change our verb to dormiunt, the girls are sleeping. The nominative is the only case that has any sort of control over the verb. In sentences with linking verbs, like est, both sides will use the nominative case. Canus est fessus. The dog is tired. And both canus and fessus are nominative. The genitive case is most often used for possession, and we like to translate it with the word of before the noun. So gladius militus, the sword of the soldier. Or perhaps it would be better to say the soldier's sword. We have this quasi-genitive case in English with the apostrophe S that indicates possession. And you can see a relic of the genitive from Old English in the word whose, the possessive form of who. The genitive can be used in other ways, though. We can say pars urbis, part of the city. There is also a genitive of description, puela maximae pulcritudinis, the girl of greatest beauty. We can also have a genitive which acts like an object to another noun. Timor condom, the fear of dogs. Remember that the U-M is the third declension genitive plural ending? Here, dogs are the quote-unquote object of fear. But since timor, fear, is a noun, we have to put dogs into the genitive case. In these last few examples, we use the word of for a translation, but there's no possession involved with the genitive. The dative case is used for indirect objects, and we often use the words to or for when we translate. The indirect object is the word that receives the direct object, like this. Ego donum tibi do. I am giving a gift to you. Tibi is in the dative case because it is the noun receiving the gift, the direct object of the verb. There's more on direct objects in a little bit with the accusative. We can also translate certain datives with the word for, however, like this. Ego wilam tibi edifico. I am building a house for you. You can think of the dative tibi as still receiving the house, the direct object, but it's more like a reference. I'm building a house, and the person who's getting that house is you, and it's to your benefit that I'm building this house. The dative can also show possession, like the genitive. We often see this in constructions with to be. Mihi est equus. There is a horse for me, literally. 
but it's much better to say, I have a horse. There's also the Latin phrase, mihi nomen est, which I would translate as, my name is. Here, mihi is showing a possession towards nomen, even though literally this phrase is, there is a name for me. The accusative case is used primarily for direct objects. These are the words that receive the action of the verb. So in the sentence, puella puerum amat, the girl loves the boy, puerum is the direct object accusative. He receives the loving. You will also see the accusative case used with certain prepositions, like ad. So if you are going to the house, the word house would be in the accusative, ad wilam. Many of these prepositions deal with motion towards, like ad, or in plus the accusative means into. So in wilam is into the house. But not all prepositions that take the accusative show motion towards. Also, the accusative case is used to show duration of time. So the phrase tres horas would be for three hours, and quinque dies for five days. The ablative case is perhaps the most complex of all the cases. It's standard to use the words by, with, from, in, or on when translating the ablative case, and these five prepositions illustrate many of the different uses of the ablative case. In short, the ablative case kind of turns the noun into an adverb. Now let me put this another way. If we had a sentence like this, the gladiator was wounded, gladiator vulneratus est, we can ask, how was he wounded? Then answer that with an adverb, violenter, violently. Or we could answer that how question with an ablative noun, by a sword, gladeo. It will take a long time to cover the different uses of the ablative, and that's why I like to remember just by, with, from, in, on, and pick the one that makes the most sense in the sentence, and you're probably right. I mean, the ablative case can be used to show something that did an action, that's by, accompaniment, that's with, separation, that's the from, or where something took place, that's in or on. It's best to remember that the ablative case often will answer the question, how? You can also use the ablative case to show a time when something occurred. That's like quarta hora, at the fourth hour. And finally, the ablative, like the accusative, is used with certain prepositions. Often these prepositions will show location, like in plus the ablative means in. So in wila is in the house. Or motion from, too. Like ex means from. Ex arca, from the citadel. Those are the big five. So we're left with just the vocative, which has the same ending as the nominative for every word except singular nouns in the second declension. The vocative, as its name suggests, is what you call someone. Vocare means to call. So if you want to identify to whom you're speaking, you would use the vocative case. Marque, quid know we? Marcus, what's up? And Caesar used the vocative when he supposedly said, et tu, brute? Slaves would refer to their masters with domine in the vocative, and the masters would call back to them, pueri, in the vocative. So here are the big generalized summaries for each case. There's much, much more detail to know about each case in Latin, enough to fill up a good 50 pages in a detailed grammar book. But you know, if you know just this much about these six cases, you'll get far in Latin. Trust me. <laughs>